For this retrospective video, I am going to talk about some films from director Lucio Fulci. For those who don't know, Lucio Fulci was an Italian director who worked for many years from the 50s through to the 90s, and while he covered many genres in those years, from westerns to comedies, sci-fi, the films he's really known for are his horror films. Now in this video, as the title may have suggested, I am only focusing on three of his films, but he made several. And in terms of quality, it's kind of all over the place. Falci is a very in-your-face type of horror director. When most directors would cut away, he zooms in and hangs on the image. So his films do come down to taste, as there is a lot of gross-out visuals and very violent things being shown for extended periods of time. The thing Falci is known for in his films especially is eye trauma. There are a whole lot of eyes popping out in his films. So if that makes you screamish, then get ready because the three films that I am covering in this video are City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, and House by the Cemetery, which are the unofficial Gates of Hell trilogy from the director. He made these films all back to back from the year 1980 to 1981, along with the film The Black Cat in between The Beyond and House by the Cemetery, and he also directed New York Ripper in this time. So he was really busy and he had a really good crew because I think by a lot of fans this stretch is looked at as some of the best work of his career. These three films, as the name of the trilogy kind of gives away, they are all connected by the fact that they have gateways to hell in them. Other than that, they are more so stylistic sequels that have the same recurring cast in them but all have their own interesting strange stories. I recommend all of these films and I don't really want to sit here and go through all of the events of all of these films as I do recommend these and hope that these videos can be for people who have I've seen these films before who want to hear an appreciation of random moments of them and so anyone who hasn't come across these yet has an idea of what to expect so first up is 1980s city of the living dead <laughs> So City of the Living Dead is about a psychic who participates in a seance where she sees a vision of a Dunwich priest hanging himself in a church cemetery, causing her to die of fright. New York City reporter Peter Bell investigates the seance and learns that the priest's suicide has somehow opened a portal to hell and must be sealed by All Saints Day or else the dead will overtake humanity. Out of the three of these films, this would be for me the most jumbled in terms of story. Initially, it felt like a lot of different plot lines that don't come together, but I will say that it did pull itself together a bit in the last act. With all of these films, the story is kind of light, but the other two don't have quite as many side characters throughout the film. I do like this movie though, it is a very gory one at that. This does have a lot of very drawn out sequences where the ghoulish zombie characters are walking towards a character that is just paralyzed in fear by their appearance, and it feels like a decade. But those elements do to me add a kind of charm to these films and I think the overall imagery and ideas do hold up in terms of horror and scares. I want to try and just talk about moments in the film that stood out to me and while the opening is very shocking and the film just kind of throws a whole lot out the gate, the first moment that I want to pinpoint in the film is the introduction of the Junies Lounge. Like we're in the wrong season suddenly, damn dust, all these high winds, pretty unusual. In this scene you have two guys sitting at the bar and the owner standing behind the bar talking when suddenly the mirror behind them smashes with four big mar marks on it. While you don't see what makes the impact, the moment is made impactful through the use of the camera and the editing. You don't see what made the four marks, but there are four uses of camera movement in the scene. The scene was really the first moment in watching this that really stood out to me, where the film had slowed down for a minute, and immediately with that use of the camera and the editing, the tension in the scene is brought back up. A few beers and you fellas start seeing ghouls and devils all over the place. Skipping ahead a bit in the film, Catriona McCall's character is being buried and Christopher George's character is hanging around the cemetery. Girl here, that's all. Look, why don't you guys go ahead with your work and I'll pretend I'm not around. 
will move. Earlier in the film, we see the dead priest with his pale face makeup on, and I just love how this sequence plays out where all the shots of her face in the coffin have her lit to be pale and cheeks appearing more flushed, like what has been established the look of the dead characters in the film. Then once she wakes up, it cuts to a different angle that shows her differently. Shortly after this, Christopher George's character starts trying to bust her out and he uses a pickaxe to hack into the coffin and it goes right past Catriona McCall's face, which that's an idea that Fulci does go back to later in this trilogy. <laughs> Then a little bit after this, we are introduced to what the undead Father Thomas is up to when we see a couple off parked alone in their car, when he appears in front of them and begins just staring at the girl in the car, and what follows is one of the most gruesome images in horror I've seen in a while. I don't know what the logistics of it are, but he makes her throw up all of her organs and the camera does not cut away. Then if that isn't enough, her boyfriend in the car gets his brain ripped out the back of his head. And that really becomes the undead character's trademark in this movie. There's just a lot of brains getting ripped out. After that we get introduced to a creepy mortician guy who was preparing the makeup on a young girl who recently passed, then not long after we see her parents seeing her in the coffin for what I assume is the first time. And this moment actually is really great as the father asks Carl DeMeo's character to take the son out for a bit and he does so and begins sincerely explaining to the boy what's going on and I love how the music is in this scene. The music is loud so you can just make out what he's saying, but it all worked really well and there's a real sense of dread in that scene. Take a walk. You have to be strong now. To find the courage to face now. You have to be a man now. You know what I mean? After that, this movie has a lot more in it. There's a swarm of maggots, a drill through somebody's head, and a whole lot of undead. I do think overall this film felt a little messy story-wise with a lot of characters, but I do think pretty much all the horror elements were executed wonderfully and this film has so many images and ideas that are just perfect classic Halloween horror tale type of stuff. <laughs> The Beyond is about a young woman who inherits an old hotel in Louisiana where, following a series of supernatural accidents, she learns that the building was built over one of the entrances to hell. This film I think is the most known of these three and is often heralded by fans as Fulci's masterpiece. It is one that I, in the past year, have watched many times and really think is just a perfect horror film at its core. While story-wise it's not the strongest, and arguably the story is barely there, but it is the execution and the overall tone that this film sets that it's best with. The tone has, to, has a lot to do with the direction of the film, but the music does a lot as well. I have also seen that this October there's a new 4K restoration of this film that is being screened at some theaters, and it is also a new cut of the film from the composer featuring an all-new score. This is a really interesting release, while at the same time I find it to be a very strange decision. While a new cut could be interesting, the original music is great to me and is one of the first things I think of when I think of this film. The main theme in particular when it comes to the opening credits and final shot is just perfect for this film. So while I'm interested to see a new cut and hear the new score, I am happy that I have my copy here of the original version. This film moves pretty quick and there's a whole lot of great horror sequences throughout the entire runtime of the film, but I would feel wrong if I didn't at least touch on the opening scene. The film starts showing Louisiana in 1927 with a painter working on a hellish painting in, a, in room 36, as a bunch of men with bats and chains and various weapons arrive in boats. They break into his room, slash him with a chain and drag him to the basement, and nailing him to the wall in a crucifix position, pouring some sort of wax or just molten liquid all over him, all because he apparently opened a gateway to hell. 
It's such a brutal opening and it uses as little dialogue as possible. The most impactful moments in that opening are the moments that are silent or just the sound of the guy getting hit with the chain. And of course, as I said before, when the score comes in with the flames for the opening credits, it's pretty great. We will invade the world. To zoom ahead a little bit further into the film, there is the moment when Catriona McCall's character is driving down the highway away from the hotel. This scene is one of the most beautiful looking moments in any of these films and it really fits the film and scene where she is leaving the hotel of hell in this long purgatory road to heaven away from it before she is pulled back to it. It's a great moment and definitely one of the more iconic shots in the film. My name is Emily. I've been looking for you. Speaking of the shots, there are a lot of snap zooms in this film, of course, but this film in particular to me has a lot of standout shots. One in particular is the scene when our two leads, John and Lisa, are in the bar and John gets a call from the hospital at the bar and the shot for him leaving the table to go to the phone is really convoluted for what it needs to show. But I love it just because they chose to show something so simple in such a creative way. Now again, I'm not going to run through all of the events of the film. I definitely recommend checking this one out around Halloween. The gore is of course turned up to the max and it definitely just goes for shock. But if you look at the entire film as just one big hellish nightmare, the film really works. The story for The House by the Cemetery is after a doctor kills his mistress and himself while researching the mysterious previous owner for his Boston home, his colleague, Dr. Norman Boyle, takes over his research and moves his family from New York to Boston to the Boston mansion. Soon after, Boyle's young son, Bob, becomes plagued by visions of a young girl who warns him of a danger within the house. So as much as I enjoy the other two films, this one is kind of my favorite. I've seen online that this is looked at as the lesser of the three, but to me this film works and it is a wonderful classic feeling haunted house flick with some gory kills and a great ending. There are two major issues I've seen online for this film brought up. One is the dubbing for Bob the Sun. My name is Bob. He is voiced by what sounds like a middle-aged woman and it is a bit distracting and laughable at times. Oh, Dr. Freudstein. Who's Dr. Freudstein? If you can look past that a bit, I do think this film is a good bit of horror fun, even if it is a bit campy at times. And they're on the starting grid set for the big race, Yogi. On your mark, go! The other issue I've seen brought up for this film I find kind of interesting is this is something I'm pretty sure was a bigger issue upon its release, but it is the comparison of this film to The Shining. Both films have blood coming out of non-living things, fathers trying to axe their way through a door, the fact that the film's core cast is the same. They both have plots that involve the father relocating the family for work. There's probably more, but my reason in bringing this up is that I had watched this film before hearing that comparison, and while I do understand that they did come out a year apart, this coming out after The Shining, I never thought of The Shining at all while watching this. This to me doesn't feel the same at all to The Shining, and I find the criticism to be kind of weaker now because the film, to me at least, is sits in different areas from The Shining. It's a different kind of horror film. I will say too, because it is a standout moment in the film for me, and it adds to that criticism point, is the shot when the father Norman is trying to ax his way through the door and the zombie Dr. Freudstein is holding Bob's head to the door on the other side. This is an idea that Fulci tried before in this trilogy in City of the Living Dead with the pickaxe going through the coffin when Catriona McCall is laying inside. I found it very effective in this film and I thought the moment was a great idea for a horror scene and again, I didn't think of The Shining when I saw this film for the first time. I will talk a little bit about the monster of this film, the evil Dr. Freudstein, which yes, is a pretty terrible name for a movie monster, villain, whatever. That being said, I do think it works in this film because this to me, even with the brutal gore in it and the ending, it feels like a classic campy haunted house film. So by that I mean it's not like a film like The Changeling where that film to me holds up perfectly and there is a strong drama and story there. The performances are great and it's just a classic haunted house movie. 
this is that, but it also has all the gore and strange dubbing, and I can't say every character is memorable. The only reason I remember Bob is because of the dubbing, and the only reason I remember Freud's Dean is because it's so goofy. This film is like a step forward for story in the trilogy where it has the most of the three, yet it ups the campier elements so much that I can see how after the beyond, which is just a nightmarish masterpiece where the story really doesn't matter, this could be a bit of a disappointment. But now watching it, this is a film that is just perfect for Halloween, and it's a fun time. Somebody is there! Get the door open! So there you go. For Halloween, I wanted to try and talk about some horror films in a retrospective video, and these films seem perfect. I highly recommend all three of these for anyone looking for a film or films to watch at home this Halloween, and to anyone who's seen these films. Leave your thoughts in the comments. And I am curious if I'm the only one who loves House by the Cemetery the most, despite all of its flaws. If anyone's seen the new cuts of the Beyond, if that's premiered, I have no idea, leave your thoughts in the comments. I want to continue doing more of these kinds of videos, going back talking about older films, so if you like the video, like it and leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe.